Welcome, everyone. For those who don't know me already, my name is Darren Lytle. You've probably seen my face before as I've been working in the oil and fats industry for the past 30 years, and I'm currently the Secretary Treasurer for the AOCS Processing Division. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us for this pre-event. It's associated with the 2023 AOCS Annual Meeting and Expo being held in beautiful Denver, Colorado, this 30th April through 3rd May. Uh, don't forget also the AOCS Continuing Education Program short course, that titled Edible Fats and Oil Processing, Basic Principles and Modern Practices. That's being held just prior to the conference on 29th and 30th of May. And there you can also see uh, some more great talks from Alan. So we're now gonna hear uh, about measurement and science and industry. And today's event is brought to you by the Processing Division of AOCS. We are streaming onto all AOCS social media so hello and welcome to everyone also watching on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the like. We have staff monitoring all the streams, so please enter any questions that you have into the comments, and they will be addressed at the end of the session. And if you're here in Zoom with us, please put your questions into the Q&A section, and we'll also address that uh, when at Alan's conclusion. So our speaker today is Alan Payne, who I know very well and has also been in the oil and fats industry for quite some time. He's a chemical engineer who has spent most of his career in the vegetable oil industry. He joined Simon Rose Downs in Hull, England in 1984, which was subsequently purchased by DeSchmidt in 1988. Between 1995 and 2000, he actually uh, worked in my hometown in, at DeSchmidt's office in Atlanta, Georgia, then worked in Europe from 2000 until his recent retirement here in 2020. And he now works as a part-time consultant from his home in England. Throughout his career, Alan was involved in the sales, design, and commissioning of vegetable oil refineries. He has performed audits studying the operation and efficiency of existing plants and designed successful upgrades for refineries, even when some of the original design information was not available. Alan has been the vice chair of the AOCS Processing Division since 2020 and is a regular contributor to the Inform Connect Forum. He's also a regular speaker at AOCS meetings and at seminars August uh, organized by the U.S. Soybean Export Council. Even more interesting, I think, away from the vegetable oil industry, Alan enjoys acting in amateur theater. He plays the classical guitar and is a writer. In fact, Alan has had a science fiction novel accepted by a publisher, which is expected to come out in the fall of 2023 under the name of Alan R. Payne. Well, with that all way too brief introduction to cover the whole of his life, I will turn it now over to Alan. Thanks very much, Darren. Um, good to see everyone here. Yeah, this is quite exciting, um, writing a novel. It, it, it's probably the first uh, science fiction novel to at least briefly mention uh, the production of edible oils, but um, that's another story. It's not really about edible oils, it's about something else, but, but never mind. But oil is being made to more and more exacting standards. So it's important to be able to me accurately measure the performance of processing equipment to achieve the best possible result with good quality oil, low losses and high efficiency. The rise of artificial intelligence makes it possible to take control to a new level, uh, providing it doesn't destroy us, of course, as depicted in the Terminator films, and we'll need high level instrumentation to take advantage of this opportunity. And even if we're not using AI, we can still benefit from the best possible measurement and control. To help us, get there, the upcoming conference will include sessions on machine learning and AI, analysis and quality control, and showcase the latest instrumentation in addition to a wide range of other topics. In any system, such as a vegetable oil processing plant, whatever enters it must be equal to whatever leaves it, plus or minus any accumulation inside. But when I said I was doing a talk on how to make accurate mass balances in vegetable oil refineries, an old hand in the industry said to me that it couldn't be done. And he was not entirely wrong. Refinery managers keep a careful note of the oil they receive and the amount of oil that they produce by looking at a combination of the amount of oil in calibrated tanks, flow meter readings and weighbridge measurements. The amount of finished oil is always less than the amount you started with, and it's not easy to find out where the losses have occurred. Even the nuclear reprocessing industry isn't able to keep track of all the plutonium that they handle 
even though it's one of the most dangerous and expensive materials known to humankind, but more of that later. Here is a result of a performance test that I took part in, in a soybean oil refinery. The oil lost between the feed and product tanks was 31 tonnes. But the amount of oil calculated in the side streams was only 24.7 tonnes. This discrepancy of 6.3 tonnes was 0.8% of the oil throughput. And on average, it seems difficult to balance all the flows in a refinery to better than about 0.5%. If we had a better idea of where the oil was going, we might be able to do more to control the losses and improve profitability. In this talk, we shall look at the various ways that errors can occur in vegetable oil refinery mass balances and also take a look at some of the broader issues to do with measurement in science and industry. In some areas of science, it's possible to make measurements much more accurately than most of us are used to. Albert Michelson spent a large part of his life measuring the speed of light. Probably his best result, known result published in 1927 involved reflecting light through a series of mirrors one of which was rotating at over 500 times a second from Mount Wilson Observatory in California to Mount San Antonio 35 kilometers away and back. Without the benefit of modern electronic timing, his final result was just over one part in 100,000 away from the currently accepted figure. Now Michelson had two advantages over us. Firstly, the speed of light is the same yesterday, today and tomorrow, whereas we are trying to measure things that are constantly changing. Secondly, Michelson et al. were able to spend years perfecting their experimental method. And this can be a lesson to us as well. We don't need to be as thorough as Michelson, but if we go out into the factory just on one day and try to take a series of measurements, we shouldn't be too surprised if we don't get a fully consistent picture. But if we look for sources of error and repeat the same investigation, then it should be possible to improve the long-term accuracy of our results. As I indicated already, I'd like to take a look at an example in the nuclear industry. In a nuclear reactor, neutrons arising from the fission of uranium-235 bombard uranium-238 and turn some of it into plutonium. The plutonium is recovered from the spent fuel rods and then used as fuel itself. In 2005, news emerged that the UK Atomic Energy Authority had lost 30 kilograms of plutonium in an audit of the previous year's production. This may not sound very much, but the destruction of Nagasaki in 1945 was brought about by the fission of only one kilogram of plutonium. So the initial reaction of some sectors of the press was to wonder if it had been stolen by terrorists. Fortunately, it quickly emerged that 30 kilograms was the discrepancy between the amount of plutonium measured in spent fuel rods and the amount in new fuel rods plus various side streams. It wasn't a case of 30 kilograms of plutonium on a shelf somewhere that had suddenly disappeared. The company explained that the discrepancy only amounted to about one part in a thousand or 0.1% of the tons of plutonium that they had handled. The UK AEA described the apparent loss of 0.1% plutonium in their reprocessing plant as an accounting discrepancy. And this is certainly one way of looking at it. But the first refinery investigation that I took part in was for a customer who was experiencing a loss of two or 3% of rapeseed oil, which is also known as canola, in excess of what they normally expected to lose. The factory has since closed and the company absorbed into another one. So I think it's safe to talk about what happened. The first attempt we made to measure the oil leaving and entering the bleacher and deodorizer that we supplied and balance the losses with the oil in the side streams resulted in a very large discrepancy. And we had to study the methods we were using so as to improve the accuracy. It was only on the third attempt that we managed to sort out all the bugs in the measurements we were making 
and show that the unexplained loss was only about 0.5% instead of two or three. The answer to this puzzle came from an unexpected source. The factory included a hydrogenation plant. Hydrogenation is a way of increasing the melting point of unsaturated oil by adding hydrogen in the presence of a catalyst to the carbon-carbon double bonds in the fatty acid chains. It's also known as hardening. It's not such a popular process today because of a large amount of trans isomers formed in the side reactions. In this particular factory, they were hardening batches of fish oil and then measuring the iodine value after hydrogenation, which is an index of a degree of hydrogenation or hardening. They frequently found that the oil was slightly over hardened, so they added a small amount of rapeseed canola oil to bring it back to the right consistency. This use of the rapeseed canola was not being recorded, so the accounts showed a surplus of hardened fish oil, which no one was worried about. But the management had picked up on the deficit of rapeseed canola. Years later, I was talking about this with someone at the same facility, and he told me that the internal accounting of oil was a contentious issue, and it was probably best not to talk about it. The conclusion at the end of all this was that a large part of a loss in this refinery was an illusion caused by looking at the numbers in the wrong way. Now, it's unlikely that you would ever see another situation exactly like the one I've described here. But the point I want to make is that whether you are working in edible oil refining or something else, whatever you see happening and however puzzling it seems, there's always an explanation that you might have to look for that explanation in an unexpected place. Now, if the highly regulated nuclear industry cannot always reconcile all the flows in and out of their plants to less than 0.1%, then it will probably be difficult for our industry to match it, even though the value of 0.1% of the oil produced by a thousand ton a day plant is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. But we have to try and do the best we can. As I've already said, in a short trial, it only seems possible to balance all the flows in a vegetable oil refinery to about 0.5% on average. So what are the causes of these apparent losses and how can we better understand what is happening? In vegetable oil neutralization, mass flow meters are sometimes used to measure the flow in and out of a separator to determine the amount of soap stock produced. It's a useful indication of short-term variations, and you can get an instantaneous reading of the soap stock flow. But you have to totalize the flow over an hour or more to get a good idea of a total loss, including the sludge discharge. If the flow meters have an accuracy of 0.1%, which is fairly typical, then the overall measurement could be out by up to 0.2% because of the two meters added together. Now, this is OK for daily monitoring, but we need to do better than that if we want to balance the flows to within one part in a thousand. Instead of measuring the oil flows, you could measure the soap stock flow. And the great thing is that if you only measure the soap stock flow to within one percent, then in this example, you would have measured the difference in oil flow in and out of a separator to within 0.04 percent which is five times more accurate than using highly accurate mass flow meters on the inlet and outlet of the machine. It's common to discharge sludge three or four times an hour, and this can amount to at least 0.2% of the oil flow. Every time this happens, the balance of a separator is upset, which could lead to additional losses, so it's definitely worth investigating in more detail. If you have weighed and monitored the flow of everything and you are still not sure whether you have a good result or not, then there is still fortunately another way to study the performance of, of a refining separator. The sodium balance method by Craw and Sullivan was presented at the fall meeting of the AOCS in 1960. 
and published in the JAOCS in April 1961. And it's available to members on the AOCS website. I won't go into all the details, but the method relies on measuring the sodium content of three main streams and the percentage treat, which is the flow of caustic soda solution compared with the flow of oil. But the neat thing is you don't need any flow rate data. The percentage treat can be determined by titration, monitored with a pH meter. So what we have here is a way of double checking any calculation based on flow rate and or weight measurements. A simple formula calculates the refining loss, which is the difference in oil flow between the inlet and outlet of a separator. The paper showed that the difference between the refining loss calculated by weighing and calculated by sodium balance was between zero and 0.2%. One more thing to consider is water. Water is sometimes added to soap stock to make it easier to flow and oil at the exit of separators usually contains more water than the unrefined oil. So this has to be taken into account when making a full mass balance. In bleaching, the oil is mixed with powdered clay, often called bleaching earth, to remove color and other impurities. The clay or earth is then separated from the oil in a filter. When the filter is full of oil, uh, when the filter is full, the oil is blown out of the vessel and steam then passes through the cake to dry it, removing as much residual oil as possible before it is dropped into a container. Sampling the filter cake to measure the oil loss is not always easy, and you have to find a way to reach in to get the sample uh, without uh, and making sure the next batch is, isn't about to fall on your head. The cake may not have dried evenly, so a single sample may not be representative, and it's possible for some oil to separate out and collect at the bottom of the container. It's probably best to take several samples from different parts of the container, including some from as far below the surface as you can get, and then combine them together. In a deodorizer, free fatty acids and other volatile materials are removed by injecting steam into the oil at high temperature and low pressure. Organic matter removed from the oil is captured by the scrubber, but some good oil is also carried into the scrubber, adding to the overall losses of the refinery. The flow of distillate captured by the scrubber can vary from about 0.3% to 6% or more, and can be measured by a totalizing flow meter and or a calibrated tank. As we saw with soap stock, we do not have to measure the distillate flow with great accuracy in order to very accurately determine the percentage of oil loss between the entry and exit of a section. That's because the oil flow is so much larger than the flow of distillate. The amount of oil loss is often estimated by measuring the acidity of the distillate. This is a useful test for daily monitoring and will quickly show if there's been a dramatic change inside the deodorizer, but it is not accurate enough to make detailed mass balances. Instruments in a plant can transmit data to the control room, but you can't always believe what you read on the screen. Temperature is usually fairly easy to measure and the reading on the screen is likely to be reasonably accurate. But deodorizer pressure and steam flow are much more difficult, and just because it says something on the screen doesn't make it true. Vacuum readings can be affected by the meter falling out of calibration, air leaks in the connection to the vessel, and inaccurate translation of the signal into a number on the screen. For vacuum measurements, it's always a good idea to get a second opinion from another instrument. The McLeod gauge is an ingenious device that after being connected to the deodorizer is turned upside down so that the mercury inside traps and compresses the sample of gas so that it's possible to get a very accurate reading. The weakness of the McLeod gauge is that mercury has to be very dry to avoid the vapor pressure of the water affecting the reading. 
so it has to be connected to the deodorizer via a cold trap. There are a range of various uh, handheld electronic vacuum meters on the market, and these can be very useful but may need recalibrating from time to time. At the right here, there is the Edwards 0 to 25 millibar absolute pressure indicator. Although you can only read it to plus or minus 0.5 millibar, it's a very useful to device to have permanently installed on the deodorizer to check that the screen reading is at least approximately correct. Another important measurement in, the de in deodorizing is the volume of steam, which is proportional to the mass of steam divided by the pressure. The steam flow to a deodorizer is usually controlled using uh, critical flow orifices, usually square edged critical flow orifices. The steam flow in kilograms per hour can be calculated from the absolute pressure of the steam in bar, bar absolute, always remember bar absolute, multiplied by the orifice diameter in millimeters squared, all multiplied by 0 0.3. Now the result of this formula isn't absolutely perfect, but it's close enough for practical purposes. Usually deodorizers have a number of orifice plates and steam valves so that the steam flow to different parts of a deodorizer can be controlled separately. It's common to see a steam flow meter in series with the orifice plates. Unfortunately, it's also common to see that the steam flow indicated by the meter does not match that calculated from the orifice dimensions. It's important to reconcile these two readings. If they matched each other in the past, but have now fallen out of step, it's important to know why. Some types of meter have been calibrated to only give an accurate answer at one specific pressure and temperature of steam, whereas others have built in temperature and pressure compensation. It's possible for orifices to become warm so that they are passing more than the expected amount of steam and the steam injection holes in the deodorizer can become blocked so that the pressure drop across the orifice is less than expected. And in the case, as, as in the case of vacuum transmitters, there might be an error in the conversion of a signal from the meter into a screen reading. Here are some typical conditions for deodorizing soybean oil. The oil temperature in the deodorizing tray is 240 degrees Celsius. The pressure is three millibar. And the steam injection into the deodorizing trays is 11 kilograms of steam uh, per, per ton of oil, 11 kilograms an hour of steam per ton of oil. And in the heat transfer and buffer trays, they're using two kilograms of steam for every ton of oil. And it's important to be able to accurately monitor these parameters. Now, a deodorizer like this, operating like this, would commonly be described as using 13 kilograms of steam per ton of oil. That's two plus 11. But it's more accurate to consider the steam to the deodorizing compartment separately. The heat transfer and buffer trays are mostly at well below deodorizing temperature, so can contribute relatively little to the deodorizing effect. If these trays only need two kilograms per ton of oil, and we use three kilograms instead, which is quite easy to do, quite easy to overlook the settings and just turn the valve up a little bit too high, then only 10 kilograms per ton will be available for deodorizing without overloading the vacuum system. And the deodorizing capacity will be reduced by nearly 10%. In any investigation, we have to be careful to avoid interpreting data in ways that confirm our preconceptions. It's often said that glass is not a solid, but a supercooled liquid. So when it was discovered that very old panes of glass were often thicker at the bottom than at the top, this was seen as evidence that over the centuries, the glass had slowly flowed down to the bottom of the frame. But then a more prosaic explanation emerged 
that medieval glassmakers could not easily make perfectly flat sheets of glass as we can today. So they used to install the glass with the thicker end at the bottom. Of course, this is only a fun example, but whether you're involved in edible oil refining or something else that involves making observations and drawing conclusions from them, then you always need to be on your guard against making false assumptions and allowing your expectations to bring you the result you expect. If we do not get the result we expect, then this could be because we made the measurement incorrectly or we've not fully understood the system we're trying to study. In 1887, long before his very successful 1927 measurement of the speed of light, our old friend Michelson got together with Morley to try and measure variations in the speed of light due to the Earth's movement through space. But in spite of devising a very sensitive apparatus, they couldn't measure any difference at all between the light traveling along the Earth's orbit and at right angles to it. This is one of the most famous apparent failures in the history of science and was eventually solved by Einstein's special theory of relativity that says that the speed of light is independent of the speed of the observer because of the fundamental nature of time and space. In our own work, we may come across things that are very hard to understand, but there's always an explanation which we should be able to find out without involving a new theory of how the universe works. Here's something a bit closer to home, illustrating that even an accurate reading can give a misleading impression. The scrubbed vapor from a deodorizer passes to a vacuum system that maintains the deodorizer at a pressure usually of a few millibar. In a vacuum set consisting of steam jet ejectors like this one here and condensers, there is always a maximum water temperature above which the system does not work. At one startup I was at, the cooling tower fan was being controlled to save electricity. The temperature indicator at the entrance to the vacuum set was reading a steady temperature. But the deodorizer pressure was fluctuating up and down on a regular cycle. We struggled this for, with, with this for some time before I had the idea of checking the water temperature by holding a laboratory thermometer in a water at the bottom of the tower. What I found was that the water temperature measured by the laboratory thermometer was going up and down as shown by the black line as the controller turned the cooling tower fan on and off. So the water temperature was periodically rising above the upper limit shown by the blue line. The dial thermometer was accurately measuring the average water temperature shown by the red line. But instead of fluctuating, the reading remained steady because the sensing element was a bimetallic strip. It responded much more slowly than the liquid in glass thermometer, which emphasizes what my science teacher said about how you show, how you show, <coughs> about how you should always record the method used to make a measurement, not just what the reading was. In conclusion, we've seen that it's difficult to reconcile the overall oil loss in a vegetable oil refinery with the oil lost in all the side streams. Even the nuclear reprocessing industry cannot perfectly account for all the plutonium they handle. But this doesn't mean we can't do better. Neutralizing is an area where high losses can occur and it's difficult to study, but we can improve the accuracy of our results by repeating the same investigation a number of times so that errors are progressively eliminated. Like Michelson measuring the speed of light, we shouldn't expect to get the best possible result the first time. Errors can arise because of unrepresentative samples. Solids such as bleacher, filter cake and soap stock, which is almost a semi-solid, are especially prone to fluctuations in composition. So it's important to combine multiple samples to get the most accurate result. We must also be on our guard against coming to biased conclusions, confirm what we expected to see. And as we saw with the fluctuating vacuum, it's even possible for an effectively accurate reading 
to lead us in the wrong direction. In a busy refinery, the focus has to be on making sure that the plant is operating and the consumers are receiving their orders. It's not always practical on a regular basis to minutely examine every side stream to see how much oil is in it. But if we can improve our knowledge of where losses are occurring and use that knowledge to improve productivity, even by a very small amount, then it's definitely worth doing. Thank you very much. And now I shall invite any questions. Yeah, perfect as usual, Alan. And I think you solved uh, one of the problems I couldn't figure out early in my career. So <laughs> thank you for that as well, fluctuating vacuum. So I just invite everybody once again uh, to put their questions uh, into the chat. They'll be transferred to me in question and answer. Um, and there's several coming in already, Alan, so I'll get right to it. Um, they say that a mass flow meter working on the Coriolis principle, obviously, is plus minus 1% uh, accurate. How can you calibrate a mass flow meter? Well, I think you have to, um, I think the, the thing you have to do is, is um, uh, uh, and you, you have to obviously look up in the manual how to do it, but it, it's, it's important to, to, to calibrate the zero flow. I mean, they are pre-calibrated in the factory, but you have to, in the, in the plant, you do have to make sure that when they're full and there's zero flow, you are getting a zero reading. So I think this is, in, 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 from what I've seen, that's the, that's the most practical thing thing to do so they are um you know they're 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 factory set to, according to how much the like you know, when you buy a pair of scales you stand on them and the, you don't have to actually calibrate the scales when you buy them but it's important to check the zero uh, the zero is correct i mean you can always it's always worth looking at all different aspects of measure. If you've got a tank, a calibrated tank with some oil in, and you're passing it through a mass flow meter and it's ending up in another calibrated tank, it, it's useful to see that, you know, is the mass flow meter giving you the reading you expected? But there's no reason normally why you shouldn't expect a mass flow meter, as long as it's been zeroed properly, to, to give the right reading because it is, um, you know, it, it, it's it, directly measuring the the mass it's not inferring the mass from other things it's directly measuring the mass yep no and good point and yeah i think some of them do just to add have a temperature correction viscosity correction so it is or density correction no so, no i mean a coriolis meter is directly measuring the mass by by pushing the the uh, the oil around a kind of bend and the sort of force required that the force it gives turning the bend if you like Right. is a is a direct measurement of the mass so it's not dependent on uh the it's not dependent on measuring any anything like the viscosity or or the density or anything it's a direct measurement of the mass now it's not like the vortex shedding meter uh in steam flow where that has to compensate for the temperature and pressure of the steam and that has to be built in and, and that then has a calculation that that gives you the the kilograms per hour it's not the vortex shedding meter isn't directly measuring the mass it's inferring the mass from other things yep gotcha gotcha okay uh in using the sodium balance method do you have to measure oil in soap stock or only the sodium content no it's only the so this is the this is the beauty of it that you only have to measure the sodium content so basically you're saying well if the uh, it's looking at the the, dent the concentration of sodium in, in all the different streams, and it's working out the proportion of the flows between those streams uh, to to give the result. So uh, it all it only depends on the percentage treat, which is the 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 flow of sodium hydroxide solution into the oil compared with the flow of oil and the sodium content of the three main streams. Uh, you know, so that's the fundamental basis on which it lies. Yeah, excellent. But it's always worth say, it's always worth comparing it with other things. I mean, if you, you know, if you can use the sodium balance method and you've got some other ways of looking at it too, they, then you can be pretty sure you've got the right answer. Yeah, great. Um, 
I think this one was was given more tongue in cheek, but but I like it, so I'm going to mention it anyway. How do we know that medieval artisans were actually trying to make perfectly flat pieces of glass? Well, maybe we don't. I mean, you think if you were if you were making glass, you'd try and make it flat, wouldn't you? Rather than making it kind of wedge shaped. And oh my goodness, what are we going to do with this? Oh no, what we'll put the thickest bit pointing down. So. Um, yeah, we, I mean, a lot of what we know about history is inferred, and uh, it's, it's, it's almost Assumption. philosophy we're going to be talking about now if we get into that. Yeah. yeah. Um, another question. Uh, don't, not sure you touched on it, but I'll ask it. What about 3MCPD? How can we reduce this compound during refining? Well, I mean, one of the ways in which the precursors of 3MCPD are dramatically reduced in, in neutralization. So this is part one of the reasons why it affects the palm oil industry so much because they don't often use neutralization. Um, you must also avoid the use of uh, hydrochloric acid activated uh, bleaching earths, which in some countries is quite hard to get hold of, I believe. Uh, and in, in what's also being done is, is palm oil is being washed to remove any chlorides that could then develop into 3MCPDs, because it's uh, 3MCPD is basically like a glycerol molecule with one of the OH groups replaced by a chlorine atom. So it's uh, it's three monochloropropandiol. So it's uh, uh, it's a, a dibasic alcohol with a with a chlorine atom added on. Yep, very good. Very good. Um, yeah, please uh, keep the questions coming. Um, I can see several, I can see chat here. Is it so chat? Can I see the chat? Oh, yes. Well, and actually what you want to look at, uh, Alan, is the Q&A. There's a Q&A. Oh, right, yeah, so. But, but here's a great one, uh, maybe my favorite so far. It says, do you think it is possible to rig up a neutralization line with enough instrumentation that you could measure losses to plus one plus or minus 0.1 percent on a continuous basis using a system that not only does that but automatically decides the dosing rates and the setting of the separator fine tuner or center zoom well i think so i mean wow. it, it seems that from where we are now it seems a bit of a dream but you so if you had the if you had the i mean it would take a bit of development if you've had the soap sock tank on level um on level cells and and you were measuring the flow rate of the soap stock being taken out of the tank and and you can use these days you can use near infrared to measure various parameters in the oil like like the phosphorus content uh and, and you you you've got the uh, you know, some kind of automatic system. It's looking at the 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 loss rate, and it's looking at the the quality of the oil you're producing. And it's adjusting. So, when you look at what AI can do, uh, if a, it almost like if a person could do it, why couldn't you develop an AI system to do the same? And I'd say I don't think anyone's actually doing it. But I can't really see why that couldn't be done. And when you first sort of step into it, you say, oh, well, you know, how could you ever do that? But, you know, wait and see. Uh, and, you know, we, you know, we, we, we've seen farmers talk about how they can control the, the direction of a tractor in a soybean field to, like, centimetres. Right. You know, yeah. So they're putting down yes. the fertiliser yeah. and they're coming again with a seed and they're putting down the seed exactly where the fertiliser is. And that's fantastically sophisticated control compared to what's in the average refinery and i think they're you know we're ready for a, a sea change in how how that could be done and i say even if it costs a hundred thousand dollars you know and, and you've saved 0.1 percent of oil you you've you've certainly paid for it in a year yeah yeah well, and I agree with you. I don't. I have not seen uh, one to that degree of automation yet, but I have seen plants uh, automating dosage of their chemicals, acid, caustic, and I've also know a plant in Asia who is controlling the the separator, uh, uh, adjustable heavy face pump, automatically so, as well. So yeah, I, I, I haven't seen it myself, but I, I I I'm sure it must be out there, and it it, it it's going to be um, coming down the track. Okay, uh, here's a question. What is the difference also conceptually 
you expect between estimation to a formula like Wesson loss and the real measure it, the real measurement by measuring in the same time the flow rate in and flow rate out, you can automatically regulate the best position of the center zoom, I guess. Oh, I yeah, I mean, the, 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 Wesson, the Wesson loss, as I understand, is a, is a method for determining the, like, the theoretical minimum loss you could have. So you've got all the stuff that is oil and the stuff that isn't oil. Like say there's, you know, 90% of the, of the oil is what you might call neutral or 2% is stuff you want to get rid of. And when you take the stuff you want to get rid of, you've only taken 2%. And let's say that 2% is the Western loss, which is a, a physical test. Now, what obviously happens is that when you take that 2% that of stuff you don't want, the impurities, some other stuff comes with it. Say you take 2.5% away. instead of So you, you've now taken away half a percent from the oil you didn't want to take away. And... and what we now have to, the, the art of trying to make the process more efficient is by trying to reduce that lost oil, that's good oil that we didn't want to lose and try and reduce that to as little as possible, hopefully nothing. So that when we take impurities away, we're only taking away the impurities and not any other good oil at the same time. Right. Uh, and it is quite difficult when you, I mean, in a practical industrial situation, it's quite hard to get to the bottom of all the issues that are going on with the water content and the, the de-sludging of a separator and, and all these things. Uh, and it's quite a murky, murky thing to, to get involved with at times. But, you know, the, the important thing to, to talk about, the, the Wesson loss is, is a practical test that shows you what's the absolute minimum you could possibly get in the best circumstances. And then, over and above that, you've got the the losses which are, uh, you know, so you might say, okay, if the Western loss is 2%, I've lost 2.5% because the process wasn't totally efficient. And I'm trying to get as close to 2% as I possibly can. Yep, right. Yep, uh, excellent. We do have time for a few more questions. If anyone has more questions, please enter them into the chat. I think it's also about so yeah, while we're we think about the other the other sections of the plant, the uh, an area I think where losses are occurring that aren't always being identified is in bleaching, because what people often do is they look at the amount of oil being lost in bleaching only as the oil in cake. So you see how much oil is in the cake. They measure the oil in cake and say, oh, those are the losses in bleaching. In fact, also in bleaching, you've got not only the oil in cake, but the impurities you had to remove because when bleaching earth comes out black I and mean, it goes in white, comes out black. And that black stuff is impurities that you've removed, but they're not measured when you measure the oil in cake. You're not necessarily measuring those impurities. So there's a loss there. Not You've taken something out of the oil that you haven't really accounted for. And sometimes I think you've got... Um, some oil loss in the in the um you know when you're recovering the oil from the cake by blowing the cake with steam you're collecting the oil that's been removed by that but that's not necessarily 100 percent accurate uh, you know 100 percent perfect process and i think probably a lot of the times you go in and you you find there's more likely to be a discrepancy negative than positive so you go and you make your test you've lost a bit more oil than you thought it's you very rarely seem to be gaining it. It's always seemed to be a bit, bit down of what you expect. And I think a lot of that may be due to um, to bleaching. That there's oil sneaking away, uh, oil and and also the impurities you were trying to remove. That's sneaking away in bleaching uh, and not really being properly recorded. And this is a I think it's a source of many of the unexplained, if you like, losses that that you can you can get. No, yeah, great, great comment. Very true. And, and with that, you also, I guess, if you measure oil percentage in, in 
clay, you don't then divide that by the clay that you added, but actually by the amount of spent clay, right? Plus the oh yeah, that's right. It's it's the oil. It's the bigger percentage. The, I mean, twenty five percent oil in cake means thirty three percent of oil in the bleaching earth you started with. But if if the weight of that that cake has been added to by the impurities you removed as well, then overall you can get something like for every kilogram of bleaching earth you've used. There's something like half a kilogram of losses in the form of either oil or impurities that you had to remove. Right. Yep. Yep. Very true. Plus any oil, any oil that snuck out with the um, in the in the blowing process. You haven't recovered 100 percent of the oil that that you've uh, blown out of a cake while you were um, steaming the filter to remove the oil. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So I, I see no more questions in the chat uh, or in the question answer. So if I don't see one in just a second, I will wrap it up. I encourage everyone uh, to uh, uh, get a hold of Alan. Well, first of all, come to the AOCS annual meeting in Denver. They're invaluable, but also you can see Alan there and pick his brain. He is a true expert. I don't know how many years he will keep uh, attending the AOCS conference. So uh -huh. we, we hope for a long time, but um, yeah, don't miss your opportunity to ask even more questions. Yeah, do you, perhaps it depends how my writing career goes, you know. <laughs> All right. And since then, uh, uh, Alan, we did get one in from the, the LinkedIn connection. So Mosh and Moa, uh, mineral oil contaminants, how to avoid them during refining? Well, this is a, this is a, a, a difficult one. I mean, it, I mean, it, it, it goes back. Uh, there's so the trouble with, with, uh, Mosh is um, a mineral oil, straight chain hydrocarbon, and, and Moa is mineral oil, aromatic hydrocarbon. So these are mineral oil contaminants. And the, the difficulty with mineral oil contaminants is that there's so many of them the, and there's so many possible sources. I mean, I, I, I was watching a video recently about somebody who's doing an investigation in, in olive oil harvesting. And there was a hydraulic oil leak on the machinery that was being used for the for the olive oil spraying on the olives. You know, so the olives are being contaminated by this hydraulic oil due to a breakdown in in the um, in the field. Now there are certain things that you can watch out for, and one of the um, some types of contaminant, aromatic contaminants, uh, like the uh, the, the contamination of, of, of coconut um, with the, the fumes from the fires used to um, dry it, or, or similarly, uh, you sometimes find uh, sunflowers that have been dried using uh, you know, fumes from a, a, a diesel burner. So these can be sort of identified as likely things that you will see, and so you can treat the oil with with activated carbon to get rid of some of these types of, of aromatic hydrocarbons. Some of the others are, are, are removed uh, by normal processing, but, but not all. Uh, and I think you, know, you also have to look at ways of looking back in the supply chain and say, well, we have to control uh, you know, contamination with harvesting machinery, contamination in handling the the seed in silos, all kinds of things. And it, it's a, a very multi-pronged problem that uh, is still you know, under discussion, I think we could say. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, with that, I think we're ready to wrap up. I, I've got a lot of congratulations. Thank you, uh, Alan. It was a very informative presentation very well done so thank you and we will see everyone at the AOCS annual meeting at the end of the month thank you thanks everyone.